Hi everyone, my name is Renee Edwards and I'm the Program Director for Fairfax County Public Library. I want to welcome you to Racy Reads, our author event. Our book discussion on Tuesday and tonight's event is the kickoff for our annual Racy Reads events that will occur every August to celebrate Romance Awareness Month. This event is in partnership with One More Page Books. Please allow me to introduce one of our delightful authors. Tracy Livesay's newest release, Like Lovers Do, is a friends to lovers story set against the romantic backdrop, excuse me, backdrop of Martha's Vineyard. It's the second book in her popular Girls Trip series, novels featuring a group of women who met and formed a lifelong bond during their first year of college. In addition to winning the 2020 Emma Award for Best Interracial Romance, Tracy has been featured in a number of different publications. A graduate of the University of Virginia and the University of Virginia School of Law, and a former criminal defense attorney, Tracy lives in Virginia with her husband, who she met on the very first day of law school, and their three children. When not answering the call of wife, mother, or author, Tracy watches planner videos on YouTube and daydreams about her next designer purse purchase. <laughs> Welcome, Tracy. Thank you, Renee. <laughs> Um, hello, and I'm Rebecca Spees from One More Page Books, uh, and we are so happy to be partnering um, with Renee and Fairfax County Public Library on these Racy Reads events. Um, and I am here to introduce uh, our second author and to sort of kick off the conversation. Um, but New York Times, Washington Post, and USA Today bestseller Sarah McLean is the author of historical romance novels that have been translated into more than 20 languages. Sarah is a leading advocate for the romance genre, speaking widely on its place at the nexus of gender and cultural studies, excuse me. A romance columnist and co-host of the weekly romance novel podcast, Faded Mates. Her work in support of romance and the women who read it uh, have earned her a place on Jezebel.com's She Rose list and led Entertainment Weekly to call her, quote, the elegantly fuming, utterly intoxicating queen of historical romance. Which, what a quote. Oh, put, it, wow. put it on my tombstone. Put it on your tombstone. <laughs> so, graduate of Smith College and Harvard University, and she lives in New York City. Um, and so without further ado, I would love to turn it over to Sarah and Tracy. And Renee and I are going to get out of here. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca okay. and Renee. Thanks everyone for coming. I feel like there's this, we've all just been, I'm, I'm always worried now that like there's Zoom fatigue because there's always something going on in Romance Landia, Zoom wise. I know, but I think that's, and to me, that's a romance reader's dream. Like if me I, <laughs> like younger me, the idea that I could just get on my computer and go to all of these events and see authors I love, you couldn't, I, <laughs> you couldn't have kept me away. <laughs> Absolutely. So, well, thank you everybody for coming. I'm so excited to be here. I just want to also say that I, at the beginning of this pandemic, which does seem reasonable entirely, um, I started, I bought my, well, it wasn't my first planner. I am a failed planner. Like, I buy a new planner every January without fail for like, I mean, 30 years. <laughs> and I swear, well, it, when I was younger, it wasn't in January, it was in like August, right? Um, and I would swear I was gonna do this planning thing and um, it never works. Like I do it for two weeks and then that's the end of that. But at the beginning of the pandemic, I bought one and Tracy has been like my planner coach. <laughs> And look, I just have to show, I have to show it. So Tracy, it's right in front of me all the time, Tracy. I'm such a good student. Is there <laughs> stuff in there though? Like, is it, is it? Well, it's written? very messy, oh, but okay. yeah. Okay. I mean, it says strong. 7 p.m. Fairfax Library with Tracy. Okay, that's a start. We'll get her oh here. Oh my God. <laughs> we'll get her here, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it's like planner support group. So. <laughs> it's a sickness. I know. I know. Yeah, I love it. Uh, <laughs> so Tracy, we're here to talk about, about romance novels. Yes. Our favorite thing. One of our favorite mm -hmm. things in the entire world. So, um, yes. but can we also talk about Like Lovers Do, which is out this week, um, came out on Tuesday, and is one of my very favorite books of the year, and I'm just going to tell you how much I love you, and how much I love your books, even though you know, I, like, I've, everyone, I'm repeating this, Trace, I've said all this to Trace's face, so. Yeah, yes, yes, um, yes. Regularly, but I think she's magnificent. And the thing that I love the most about uh, Trace's books and is in every one of them that, including this one, is how remarkable her heroines are. Like nobody writes like a super competent, very badass, like take no prisoners heroine like Tracy does. And this one is no different. And I want to quote, Entertainment Weekly, because Tracy was chosen as one of the best books of the month by Entertainment Weekly this week, um, who said, Maureen there said, Like Lovers Do is a celebratory intersectional feminist manifesto. And did we mention the hammock sex? <laughs> because they have a also very important, but that celebratory intersectional feminist manifesto put that on your tombstone, I think. That's what's going on my tombstone. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Entertainment Weekly is doing it with the quotes. They are amazing. And I'm here for and, it. Yes. And Sarah knows how much I love her, how I was a total fan of hers before I got to know her. And the wonderful thing about Sarah, um, which isn't always true, is that she was even better than I imagined. Because sometimes you meet people that you, you know, you've looked up to or you enjoy their books and it's not quite what you imagine. And she has been everything I imagined and more. And so um, to have her say those things about me, considering the heroines she writes, um, yeah, I'm, I'm blown away. So thank you. Well, thank you. But let's talk about you more. Um, let's, no. <laughs> let's talk about, no, honestly, no, without, I mean, not joking, honestly, I want to talk about heroines, because I think, this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently, because obviously heroes get a lot of play in romance, yes. and we spend a lot of time talking about book boyfriends, and talking about how much we love heroes, but I think it's the heroines who really carry the genre, uh, certainly that's the ones who carry the books that I love the most, yes. and so can we talk a little bit about like why heroines are so important, what we're doing when we're writing our heroines? Yes, yes. Well, I think in the beginning, the idea of the heroine was sort of like a placeholder, right, for the reader. So as you're reading, you are imagining falling in love with the hero, which is why they were sort of the... Um, why everything is around them, why the series is around them, why we talk about boyfriends. It's because as the reader, we were sort of falling in love with the hero and the heroine uh, was the placeholder. And I also think that maybe, I just thought of this, why in the beginning um, they were kind of little milk toast because we didn't want them to be uh, maybe fully formed or have a, um, a personality that might not be the personality of the reader because then that makes it harder for you to insert yourself into that story um, and I think as time has progressed um, as more writers have come into the genre we have realized that we um, that we are more than just placeholders that mm -hmm. these are stories um, about women and about agency, about them claiming their own lives and claiming their own pleasure. And for that to be true, they needed to be 3D, fully realized humans. Yeah. And um, versus somebody that's just there so that you can, you know, pretend that you are with the hero. Well, I mean, that makes perfect. I love that idea. I love the idea that the early heroine was sort of a, I hate to use the phrase, but like a blank slate in some way. I mean, like, and they were, they were so perfect. I mean, I remember, and I know you read them too, but those early historical heroines who like birds would alight on their shoulder and they would like tame wild wolves. And I think that was doing a really interesting thing. You know, we've talked a lot about 
how um, I think those early books were really doing a lot to talk about feminism, like to talk about patriarchy and how we, how we have to sort of dismantle it whole hog. And so the, um, the heroes were kind of patriarchy in general, and certainly they were jerks and like, difficult and impenetrable, and we never got a glimpse into their minds in those early books. And so we could place ourselves on there. But the one thing that I think we've seen a real rise in, and a, um, I want more of them, is these heroines who are perceived by some as unlikable. Right. And maybe unlikable is a way that we it's because we're seeing heroines with more nuance, like you say. Yes, more personality. Right. Um, the idea that, that. So when we're writing sort of our heroines, they're our protagonists. The idea is that you want your main character to be. Um, you want them to sort of. Uh, can't think of the word it's losing I'm losing it at the moment but it's not just likable it's like interesting like you yeah want fully text. formed yes fully formed to be interesting to have goals or whatever and what I what it you used to see is that for men it was interesting to have mm. a goal do something for women it was likable and I remember you know especially some of my earlier books getting comments that you know, heroin isn't likable. You need to make mm -hmm. heroin likable. And it's like, well, but why this... does she have to be likable? Why can't she be, you know, a person who has a goal? She's very interesting. Why does she have to be likable? And also, it's called the character arc for a reason. We yeah. move, we grow, but yeah. they didn't want us to grow, right? But don't you feel this gets into, I mean, one of the things I, I, I don't know how many of you um, join because I, I talked about this in my newsletter, but one of the things that Tracy and I really wanted to do with tonight is talk about the work of writing romance, like what is what we are doing when we are writing romance, because I think the world and you're all romance fans and romance readers, so you know this, but the world outside of us often looks at us and says, oh, they're derivative, they all, you know, they're all in the same way, how could they be unique? And I think that when we talk about unlikable, and I obviously air quote, unlikable forever, <laughs> because I've never met an unlikable heroine who I didn't love. Um, but what we're really saying here is like, often these heroines are heroines who have, you know, clear goals, um, often who have uh, careers or some sort of life beyond like the, the things that we ascribe to women in the world. And we're, so we send, we, we tend to look at these heroines as being, or heroines who from the start stand up to the, the hero, right? Are unwilling to, I know this is a library, but it's after seven. So who are unwilling to take the hero's shit, right? And so, <laughs> right, 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 um, right. So I, and aren't looking for that and aren't looking for the hero or relationship or any of no. that. Yeah, And what I love, and I want you to talk about this, particularly with Like Lovers Do, is how Nick handles um, the hero in this book. Because there are moments, there's that great moment where he sort of has to learn, he has to, he has to learn some lessons from her. Yes, he does. I mean, I, you know, because it's a series and it, I, I knew sort of who my heroines were going into the series. I knew who Nick was and I knew that she was all the things that we talked about in the beginning is that, you know, she is, an un she is someone who could be called an unlikable heroine because she is career oriented. She has a goal in mind and nothing is going to stop her from getting that goal. She does not take shit off of anyone, which is kind of what gets her in the tr into trouble in the beginning. She does not want a relationship at all and she's very sex positive. And so all of these things are things that um, women are not supposed to be. Um, and, you know, she speaks her mind. She's, you know, she's not soft in any, you know, in, in any way at all. And so I knew who she was. And I also knew that she was not going to compromise her goal. She was going to get what she wanted to get, the way she wanted to get it. And she was going to get the guy at the end because I do write romance and you know, that was important mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. my happily, happily ever after. Um, so what it took was I had to think 
about who the hero was going to be mm -hmm. because not every hero would work for her because not every man is going to work for her. And the thing with him is I still wanted, I still wanted him to be alpha in his own way. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't want, I was saying like, if you think about it, like in sort of the red carpet context, like I didn't want it to be this female celebrity who was dating the backup dancer, you know? So when she's walking down the red carpet and everyone's looking at her, he's in the background cause no one, you know, he's the backup dancer. I wanted it to be, you know, the, the, you know, actress is walking down and the, you know, her, her partner is equally well known, but he's back here and she's here and he's fine. Or he could be in finance. He's not even an actor. He's in finance. He's doing his thing in finance. But the, the spotlight is on her because that's her personality and that's who she is. So it's really important to, um, to write a man who was her, was her match and who would understand that taking care of her didn't mean she needed him financially or she couldn't do it on her own, but that it was an emotional taking care of. Mm -hmm. That was really sort of important for me to write for her. And I think that this goes back to sort of the craft piece of it, how you craft a romance novel, right? Because um, when you start off with a heroine who has a goal that isn't about love, right? Her goal is to save her job. Um, yes. Because she, she has, she has done what we have all done at some point in our life, said the quiet thing loud <laughs> and gotten in trouble for it. Right. Yes. And, yes. um, and so for her, she is absolutely in the right, but the world doesn't always right. <laughs> treat women, um, <laughs> that's, you know, as such. And so she needs, like her goal is not, has nothing to do with this hero or the, her or or love but in romance the tricky thing and this is why I say all the time that writing romance is writing is doing ballet in a phone booth right because yeah. in a romance the hero has to relate to the goal in some way and you've done this really interesting thing putting together two best friends who suddenly who are who are all of a sudden he is all of a sudden important to this other goal that she has right. and it right. it really does change the dynamic of their relationship and then of course there's a fake relationship <laughs> and it's great <laughs> <laughs> and there's a hammock <laughs> so yeah so yeah so many wonderful things but so but the, it, for writers that's so important it is and you know this goes back to what you were saying about the outside world thinking that what we do is easy and that there's no craft and that anyone, you know, that it's just some formula and anyone could do it. And, you know, all the things they say about romance, because the truth of the matter is, is that everything has to come together for it to work. Right. Like it's not just putting some woman and some man or some man and man and woman, some couple. It's not just putting a couple together and, and sending them out there. Like the personalities of the people involved is key. And so for Nick, who had this goal, she was not going to meet a man that she didn't know. And, you know, two weeks or three weeks later, they end up happily ever after. Like, because no man, one, was worth her time. Two, if she was interested, she'd sleep with them and then she'd go back to work the next day, right? She wasn't mm -hmm. going to give up everything she'd worked for, for someone she barely met. There was no need for her to do that. And plus, you know, as a um, woman of color in this industry, she had, you know, she has a shell. So she's not going to open up to just anyone, you know, the opening up that we need to sort of fall in love and, and, and end up in our happily ever after. So it, you know, yes, it was Nick, but it had to be, I think, a friend's to love is romance because that's the only person that would have the time and, and know her well enough to then be able to get to that deeper level that's necessary for them to end up together. Well, and the dynamic here is so much about power. And I think that's something that often gets missed 
understood about romance is that the idea is, well, there is a powerful hero and a heroine, and he is going to sort of throw her over his shoulder and like ride off into the sunset with her. And the reality is that one of the things that I think romance does so beautifully, and I would go so far as to say does better than any other genre, and you can quote me on this, is articulate the relation, the power between two people in any relationship. And it's not just power between the hero and the heroine, it's power between the heroine and all of her friends and all of her colleagues. And it's the power, power between the hero and his family and who holds power and how it balances out in a, in a relationship that ultimately in the romantic sense ends in partnership, true partnership, equality, right? Parity. And so when we're talking about power in romance, often we're talking, romance writers are thinking about power all the time in the world because romance as a matter of course centers a marginalized gaze, whether it's black women, queer women, trans women, women, queer men, you know. So there's this sense constantly of an awareness of the heartbeat of a romance novel being about the gaze that is not centered in any other form of media. Yes, yes. And not only that the gaze is marginalized, but the experience is marginalized, right? Just the fact that we write about relationships and we write about um, the beauty, even though the characters may not go into it with the goal of falling in love. That's actually what we try not to write. But the beauty of that whole experience, that's in itself marginalized, right? Because, you know, that's, that's woman, women's area you know if we were writing right women's work you know if we were writing you know action adventure series without the romance of course that would be something else but because the everything that we're writing is marginalized um yeah it's 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 exactly what you said it's all yeah yeah it's a really interesting i mean i think it's this idea of what the work that romance does for readers is so, I mean, this idea that you you and I have talked about this a thousand times, but the happily ever after being the thing that people criticize in romance (laughs) is so fascinating to me because at a time, especially in 2020, and I want to talk about writing happily ever after in this, you know, waves hands at world kind of time. (laughs) What's going on? What's going on? This idea (laughs) that like happily ever after somehow makes the work less valuable is really interesting because for us, I think when we look at the world, happiness is power, right? Going back to this question of power. So how is it writing contemporary romance right now? Uh... Okay, so I have chosen to just pretend that this is not <laughs> happening. Um, and, and maybe by the time my book comes out, <laughs> we will be in a different phase of it. Um, but yeah, I'm just pretending that it's not happening. And I'm recognizing that, at least in the work that, that I sort of do, what, what my point of view is and, and, and everything, um, is that it's, I'm giving um, some sort of escape in, for mm-hmm. people um, to, if, you know, if we want to see what's going on, we can turn on the news. Like you can turn on anything and, and find out what's going on in the world. But the, um, to be able to sort of take someone out of what's going on into a story that you've crafted with characters that you've crafted and give them, you know, three, four, five hours of just experiencing that, that joy that we write. Um, That's what I want to do. And so um, I know that there are going to be other authors who are going to write it in and, you know, that's great. But until, you know, someone says, Mm -hmm. this is what we're doing, I'm not doing it. But I also want to go back to what you said about society using the fact that we write HEAs as one of the things to criticize us about, which is so ridiculous because romance is genre fiction, just like mystery and thrillers and action adventure. And no one says, you know, to a mystery writer, oh, you're going to solve that mystery in the end. 
books are trash. <laughs> you know, like it's 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 such an excuse or cop out to say that's that's yeah, the so, thing. It's so predictable. <laughs> it's so predictable. Oh my God, you figured out who the serial killer was. Come on, couldn't you just let that go? Like that no, would never would, happen in real life. That's or just you know, high expectations. Idea, just oh, too much. Or the idea that um, if they read a book. And maybe it wasn't one they liked, or maybe it wasn't a good one because that's true with all books. That that then um, disparages the entire genre. You know, like I've read this one and I didn't like it, so the entire genre is trash. Can you imagine? Oh, I watched the show; it was horrible. I'm never watching TV again. Like no one would do yeah. that, but they feel well, very free. And you know? there's that old adage that like other genres get judged on the basis of their best books but romance gets judged mm -hmm. on the basis of their worst often yeah. like or at least like not the best and so there's just such a tricky it's such a difficult thing and it enrages me and I've gone sort of from the beginning of my career feeling like my work is always to like fight the fight <laughs> to now being like I'm done with that fight like I feel like we fought that fight it's clear from the world use your Google everyone and you will get a thousand interviews about the power of what we're doing but I do think one of the things that we never talk about or or rather it's not never but something that we don't talk about a whole lot is the covenants that we have with our readers like I think reader romance readers trust romance writers implicitly to take us on this wild ride right or in some in some cases not that wild but you know i think and when i think about like my books i think about or you know i think about the way that i craft a book and often i think to myself like oh i'm going into this place that maybe is dealing with an issue that isn't gonna make everybody comfortable or like something's gonna happen and it's gonna really like cut your heart out and leave it on the on the ground um and i think that with in romance we as readers trust our writers to take us to the end of this journey right so we're gonna go up and down and be broken and healed right. and i think that trust which i think also readers of mysteries have this trust but in romance it feels like it's an emotional trust like mm -hmm. I'm gonna in a mystery. I'm gonna I'm gonna capture your mind and how and like you're gonna ask questions the whole way. Right. Um. But in a romance, like I'm gonna capture your heart, right? Yeah. And like really make you feel it. Yeah. And I think that that trust is something that we as writers take so seriously. Like it is a burden for me knowing that at the end, like have I delivered the book? the right way for my readers like are they have have i earned their trust in this book mm. yeah i think you well i think that you have earned their trust <laughs> um i think the happily ever after is the power piece that grants us that trust because readers know that the at the end of the novel your couple is going to end up together and they're going to be happy. And because they know that, they are willing to follow us as we take them through all sorts of different machinations, like I said, up and down and around the bend and, you know, underwater, whatever it is. They are willing to follow us because they know that we said that we write a romance and we're going to deliver them safe and sound at the end of that, of that ride. And we take that very, very seriously. I mean... So yeah. see, as a genre, I mean, all yeah. you have to do is yes. get on Twitter and say, um, romance novels don't need to have a happily ever after. And that's it. I mean, you're done. That's, yeah, that's, that's three days. <laughs> that's a three day scam. I'm telling you, three full days. No one's getting any work done. That's a three day scam. <laughs> well, we're like, we, I think we were talking about this, but the, you know, there are always, you know, it's Twitter. Of course, there are scandals everywhere, but you know, one of the things that romance does better than any genre is rally, right? Like no one talks about my sister, but me. <laughs> That's right. But please don't, yeah, don't wait in with your outside opinions if you, you know, you don't know. That's like going to somebody's house, spitting and walking out. Like it's, you know, it's, it's, it's on, it's on. <laughs> if you want every <laughs> faction of romance to come for you, the happily ever after is where you go. <laughs> and we are not sad until you know that you were wrong like it's like it will you will think it's over and somebody will be like do you understand 
do we you know? <laughs> do, we need, do we do this? Do you have it? Oh, God, really. uh, there is a little, I do have like little glimmers of joy when it happens to somebody who like just had no idea. And they say it and then it's just like, I mean, just drive right there. Yeah, people, do your research. It is not hard. It is and not then hard. I love how authors from other genres come in. Like, they just say like, why would you rile up Roman? Yeah. <laughs> I've learned one thing on Twitter. Don't come for romance landing. Why doesn't everyone know that? It's like, I don't know. Like, it should be like little signposts. There should be signposts. Like, if you are going to put romance novel or book in your tweet please be aware of who where you're stepping where you're going <laughs> yeah. yeah that's us <laughs> you know um but one of the things that i really love about romance especially um now especially now in 2020 as you know waves hands at world um Tess Bailey say, likes to say that the reason why she likes to read romance is because when you wake up in the morning you can say to yourself like who do I want to be today? And there's a romance novel about that person and you can read their life like in happiness and triumph, right? All the things that we've been talking about. And I think that that's really interesting because I think romance um, is really in 2020, like tackling this question of who gets to be happy, like who gets to have happiness in the world? And our answer is everyone, right? Like, um, but, it's such a bomb when you're looking at the rest of the world, like the real world. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, because for a while, say, I think what she book. said, yeah, what she said wasn't necessarily true because there were a lot of us who, you know, who have read the genre for decades and loved the genre, but didn't see ourselves represented. And so I think that's the thing that I love about where we're going is understanding the idea of diversity in romance and not diversity like skin color not just like oh you know we need more black romance writers which you know we do i'll take it you know um <laughs> or whatever but the idea of also diversity of experience understanding that i can't write a romance novel that's going to represent all black women just like no one would ever expect that your romance novel would represent all white women like that's exactly. absolutely ridiculous but it's it's opening up to the idea that we all deserve happiness and we all deserve to have um our story told or to immerse ourselves in a story where we can see someone who looks like us who has an experience like us and and that involves um, yeah, of, of acknowledging that there is not, there's not one sort of blueprint of what, of who deserves happiness or what that story should look like. And that, that's what excites me about this genre um, in a way that it seems like other genres are still trying to figure out. Yeah. Yeah. So should we talk about craft a little bit? We talked a little bit about craft, but I know there's some writers yeah. in the group. I'm sorry, I'm going to turn the light on in my office because I started, did we, this started during the day. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a question. Sorry, voice of God coming in here. We did have a question for the best advice to, uh, for building a writing career. Uh, the question is coming from a recent college grad who is all about historical fiction. Oh. Well, congratulations. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry you um, graduated into Wave Sound at World. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we challenge. need you. It was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, the best advice that I have for you, I have two things. One is you have to read it. So if you are a historical fiction fan, you need to read as much historical fiction as you possibly can, including the stuff that is out today and getting lots of attention. If you wanna have a career, sometimes the market takes turns and you sort of figure out a way to turn with the market. Um, but, so I would say read, 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 read. And I would also say there is no secret and I think Tracy probably will agree with me, like, you can't write a book without writing a book. So, yeah. 
you just you just have to do it you just have to sit down and do it yeah. and your first draft is going to be terrible but that's what revisions are for mm -hmm. and you just keep working yeah i agree i'd also the thing i would add to in addition to sort of reading all the historical fiction um and this is coming from me, the, the planner nerd, um, it's to do a little bit of research to, um, into the industry that you're interested in going into. And it doesn't mean that you then have to follow whatever, whoever is saying what, or that you have to do that same certain path. But I think you should know sort of what the different paths are before you decide to take one. So you don't want to get into a situation where you make a decision and you don't know or have all the information um, available. So I, I, I'm a big fan of, of not just jumping in when it comes to the business part, but actually doing a little research before you do that, because yeah, that's really, really important. And make good friends. Make good mm. friends from the start. Yes, because uh, you're going to want people who are on your side every step of the way. And that is hard when you're a writer because writing is a very solitary, it's very solitary work. It is. Um, but, you yeah. know, you want a group of people who you can reach out to and ask questions. Um, yeah. And, and, and do it, I was going to say, do it organically, like, <laughs> um, I mean, I guess you can have an agenda and, and do it, but if you want to be in your industry and have longevity, like it's a small industry and people know each other and people talk. And so, you know, your reputation will follow. I mean, so my thing is it may take you a little longer, but just be genuine in your dealings with people versus mm -hmm. having an agenda. Yeah. Um, are there other questions, Rebecca? Uh, I see somebody ask. I see somebody asking in in comments about revision, which we which I just talked about. So, Tracy, do you want to talk? You want to talk about revision? Revision. Okay, I can talk about revision. Revisions are my best, my favorite part of the process. Mine too. Be uh, yeah, because I. Um, I don't know, is it was it Nora or Miss Bev, the whole thing about you can't revise a blank page or a blank screen. Like I need something uh, to get to work on. And so my process is generally that I write a fast draft. And that doesn't mean that I write it fast. I am not a fast writer, but what it means is that I don't go back. So when I start writing that first draft, I keep moving forward until I get to the end. I don't go back and look at things or revise anything. And then by the time I'm finished, I feel like I know my characters better. I know the plot because I've just, <laughs> just written it. Um, but now the stuff like themes and how I can go deeper and weave in my subplots, all of that sort of has been marinating. And so now when I go back, I have words. Um, I understand where I ended. So I know when to start weaving things in. Um, and I just like to make it pretty. Like that's what I think about my revision process. Um, I think it's very important. I know there are people who revise several times or who do different drafts on revision. Um, it is rare to meet a person who can write clean. Get to the end. Yeah, who can get to the end when um, and it's clean and ready to go. And I would posit that that person actually does revisions and stuff the entire way through. Mm -hmm. I, I love to meet the person who just comes out and it's beautiful. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, it's, I think it's very important, very important. And getting feedback, um, whether you get that through a critique group or um, beta readers or editors, if you're gonna self-pub is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, my experience is the same way. My books are very long. Um, a manuscript for me is about 450, manus 450 pages, like double space times the newer than 12. <laughs> um, and I uh, probably don't know what, I do not plot, I do not plot my books. Um, I don't start until I know the ending of my books, but I don't know how I'm gonna get to the ending. I just know 
like what the big set piece ending is that I'm working toward. It's okay. I'm and sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I wish I plotted. Um, <laughs> it sounds really awesome, actually. Um, so, but my problem is, is that I don't actually know what I'm doing or who I'm writing about until I'm about 75% of the way through the manuscript. And then I think to myself, like, oh, this is everyone's problem, right? Like every romance needs to have internal conflict. A lot of times, and you will notice this if you are a, a longtime Sarah McLean reader, you will know that I love it when a hero at about 75% of the way through the book, this is not a coincidence, reveals to the heroine <laughs> what his damage is. Because in that moment, I too am learning his damage. <laughs> Oh, this is so and then funny. I'm like, oh, that's what it is. And then I have to go back. But I mean, so I am the slowest writer there is. It takes me, this is why I only have a book out once a year. Um, it takes me months and months to draft the first, the first thing. And then I can revise in about two weeks. Because by that point, then it's like, I know. And then I can go back and I'm working, you know, I'm working 12, 14 hour days because I'm so into it. Like now I get it, but those early days are a slog. <laughs> yes. So that is my other piece of advice for those of you who are working on a manuscript. Also the middle is just always a slog <laughs> for me. And yeah. I hear, I often hear, I hear, I've heard over my lifetime as a writer, a lot of people go, well, if you're bored writing it, readers will be bored reading it. And I actually don't believe that. Right. Because I, sometimes you're in the middle and it's a slog and it's not fun and you are bored, but like ultimately you're going to make it all sparkle in revisions. I absolutely agree. And I think the thing that's interesting that you've noticed is that we have two different ways of approaching our writing. Um, and so whatever your approach is, is what works for you. Like, mm -hmm shouldn't do what I said or shouldn't do what Sarah said because you think that's the right way to do it you should right. figure out what works best for you and I think as you know especially I know for me you spend you you know what your process is but you hear people that you that you respect and admire especially when you're not published you hear that they do it a certain way so you think well if you do it a certain way then you will get published and all the good things will happen to you. Right. So you spend all this time fighting against the way you do things. So right. just do you. Uh, that's, yeah, just do you. Yeah. yeah. However you get words on the page, like mm -hmm. truly, whatever that is. I mean, I write beginning to end and I don't skip around and um, but a lot of people skip around. They write the scene that, you know, I, like I said, I always know the end. I always know the big set piece scene. I didn't write that scene until I get there. So, you know, but I could write that scene for my current book right now. And that would be great because then I would get there and it would be done. <laughs> That's not how I work. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Do we, I mean, I feel like we've just sort of wandered into taking questions so do we just want to yeah take yeah a questions? bunch have come in um okay. recently there's a couple uh that can probably pair together um okay. and then we'll probably lead into one another but there is a question uh that the she is plotting a romance series and is struggling with the sex scenes any tips mm. for writing sex scenes um and i think that might possibly uh, lead into another question that is, um, do you ever feel pressure either from readers or publishers or whoever to make your novel racier than what you are comfortable with? Do you want to go, Sarah? Uh, sure. Sex scenes are incredibly difficult to write. And I, um, I, some people are, love writing them and they pour out of them. But for me, so to give you a sense, I'll, I'll just tell you why I think I, over the years they have been so difficult for me to write. Um, when I write, again, if you've read my books, you know the pacing of them is pretty fast. Um, stuff happens in a Sarah McLean novel, like all the time. Um, and the challenge for me, so if you think about a chapter of mine, you know, a lot can happen in one chapter of a Sarah McLean novel, but the 
when you get to the sex, everything slows down. The pacing goes really quiet. And you might go, and I also write pretty hot. So, you know, you might have two, two chapters or three chapters in a row that's like all the sexy bits happening, like the, the like lead up conversation and then the actual act. And all of that is so slow compared to everything else in the book that for me, the writing actually slows down. And I always think to myself like, oh, I have to write a sex scene today. It's going to take me a day. And it always takes me three or four or five days. Um, and that's because for me, a sex, I really believe that in a romance novel, the sex scene needs to change the story. It either needs to, as Tracy was saying earlier, like character arc, right? Like it's part of that. Or it's a question of the story itself, like the plot of the story changing when they have sex. I write historicals, they have sex, like bam, she's, she might be pregnant. Like that is a thing that is real. Um, so Except that's... Grace. <laughs> Except Grace, because Grace is a woman and she knew how to take care Grace. of that to make sure that didn't well, happen. Grace also runs a bordello, so she takes care of a lot of business. So. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> that was really. That was also really. I mean, this is a separate thing, but that was really fun research. They had like IUDs essentially in the 1840s. It wasn't. It wasn't like a true IUD, but they would. Um, a lot of women would have. This is hello, everyone. Now it's like history of sex with Sarah McLean. Um, but, but, but we also take, had a question about the research, so you know, take here us we away. Go. Here we go. It might not be what they were hoping for, but here we are. Um, so they would have these. You could buy like silver charms or like pewter charms, and women would like insert them. And there was something about the way the metal like interacted that like prevented or like. I mean, presumably it was inserted right into the cervix. Like, yeah, so who I, knows? Just, so it yeah. was like a, it wasn't an exact IUD. And I don't know that these were not necessary. These, presumably there were a lot of like hygienic issues or like medical issues that came with these, but they did exist, right. Um, right. which is really fascinating. Anyway, so yeah, sex, heroines, I don't know. I don't know what I was going to say, but that's so, oh, and I've never felt pressure to, yeah heat it up or heat it up. No. or take I, it down no i haven't either and um the other thing i would say i totally agree they are very difficult to to write and so when i write my first draft i don't write my sex scenes in the first draft i would just literally i'll do a bracket insert sex scene here bracket and move on um and i do the sex scenes and my revisions for the very reason that sarah said is it's not just a sex scene. If you can skip the sex scene, then that to me means it wasn't integral to the plot. And the whole point is that people are changing. And so whether it's a conversation or um, a lowering of emotional barriers, things happen in that scene so that you should read that scene before you move forward. And so again, because my revision, during my revisions is when I do that stuff and I know my characters better, it just makes sense to, to write that scene um, during revision. And usually they're some of the last scenes I write. Yeah, that's smart. Um, I would just say also, if you are uncomfortable writing sex, it's gonna show. So yeah. don't worry about it. Like, don't write as hot as you want. There isn't a, there's no rule. Priscilla Oliveras writes gorgeous romances. And she, almost all of her sex scenes are closed door. And like, that's fine. And it's much better than writing, than sort of forcing it out. And then it does show in the writing if you're not, if you're not comfortable. Right. The important thing is, is the tension between your characters, mm -hmm. the sexual tension between your, cap your characters. But sex doesn't have to happen, you know, on the page at all for it to be a romance novel or for it to be a sexy romance novel. It doesn't have to happen uh, yeah. on the page. All right. Sorry. I've, I was talking and didn't unmute my microphone. Um, <laughs> Is there an aspect of the writing craft that uh, you feel that is just something that 
you're not especially good at or something you wish you could do better or something that you've really had to work hard on? Theme. Oh, um, overtly knowing my theme, I think. Um, I, I feel like a lot of us who are writers, um, especially if we've read romance novels growing up, there is an instinctual sort of storytelling thing mm -hmm. that we have. I mean, we sort of know the ebbs and flows of a story, where it should go. I think that, you know, that's sort of what gets us sitting down and actually beginning to write. Craft is the rest of it. Um, and theme is one of those things that I think comes to me instinctually as I'm writing, but I, I can't, I can't spell it out. I can't tell you what it is. Kate Claiborne is masterful at it. And mm -hmm. I've listened to her speak and I've made notes and I actually have this sheet of paper. I actually took a picture and tweeted it her to, to her once of her notes that so that I am mindful of how to um, incorporate that into my, my writing as I go. And I'm still not as good as I would want to be uh, with it, but like, actually knowing and writing out what my theme is, is something that I still have to work on. Um, I have a lot, I, I talk about it so much, it's going to be a surprise to some of you, but I have a lot of trouble with conflict. I mean, I have a lot of trouble. I don't have trouble with internal conflict at all. I love a damaged hero, like, but I have a lot of trouble with conflict that is, um, that keeps the hero and heroine on the page all the time together and, and also separate, right? Um, and I try really hard when I write to think, I, I'm always aiming for my favorite romances from when I was young, like in the sense of the feeling, the emotion of those romances, the, the way they made me feel as a reader. And for me, revision is a lot about like stripping out stuff that doesn't belong there, that is just gumming up the works and like really packing in conflict that keeps the characters together and engaged. And I mean, it could be, it takes me a long time to start a new book because I spend a lot of time going like, well, here are two people, but why are they? I, I have trouble always trying to figure out like, how does one, the, you know, we talked about this earlier with how well you did this in uh, Like Lovers Do, that sort of one character's goal being, um, you know, having the other character really be a piece of that in some way, really hindering that goal or helping that goal in some way. Um, and I have had a lot of false starts in books because of that. I mean, I have a lot of false starts in general with books. So um, it takes me... So don't, as Tracy was saying, like, don't ever think that those of us who are doing it for a living just, like, sit down and it pours out of us and it's great. Like, I mean, it, that's not how it works. It is a job. There is no muse. I mean, there are days where it sort of feels easier, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and the yes. one thing, the thing I, I think about all the time is, like, and this is because I don't plot, I often think, like, if I didn't write today, the book I was writing would be different tomorrow, right? Like mm -hmm. the words that I'm putting on the page today, which is kind of like a total, like, it sort of blows my mind every time I really think about it. But like, and I think this is true for plotters too, but the words that you're putting on the page in that moment are impacted by your whole world, by everything around yeah. you. Yes. And so yeah. your book is, is what it is by virtue of when you are writing it. Yes. Um, I mean, it's just, yeah, cool. that's so true. It's so true. And I don't think I hadn't thought about it in that way, but I do think about as I'm writing because I had some regular experience in life or just happened to turn the channel and see something on the TV that affected the book mm -hmm. because I incorporated. You're exactly right. Sure. I hadn't thought I mean, about that. But I do think that part of that's part of the, the, joy of romance as a reader and a writer is we all write so fast. I mean, I write slow and I still write faster than most literary writers, it, yes, right? Yes, yes. So we write so fast that our books are constantly iterating the world we're in, right? So yeah. we may not be writing COVID on the page. In fact, I would argue probably most of us are not writing COVID on the page. Right. But the idea, like, 
the experience of 2020 is going to show up. Permeate. We're going to see yeah. the scars of 2020 in romance novels Absolutely. the same way we saw the scars of 9-11 in romance novels. We saw the scars of, you know, the women's, the second wave women's movement of the 70s in romance novels. Like, the, we're seeing Black Lives Matter, the scars mm -hmm. of Black Lives Matter in the romance novels. Right. Like, these are things that are really making indelible marks on the books. Yeah. In really powerful, good ways. Like, you know, we're telling, we're telling the story of a group of, we're telling the story that centers a group of people who are not able to tell that story publicly right. all the time. Yeah, I agree. And I think that ties in, we've had a couple of questions um, touching on, again, sort of waving at the general state of the world. And do you have any tips for, you know, writing in waves hands at the world? Um, you yeah. know, <laughs> you know, how to write in difficult times such as these in that moment? Deadlines help. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful to everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, deadlines is, is key. Um, and I think maybe having a routine, having a routine helps me. Um, I write uh, in the same place. I write to white noise and to a candle. And it just trains my brain. My brain knows when that machine goes on and when I light that candle that we are writing it's work time so much so that you know even now i'm in my office i don't put the machine on i don't have the candle lit because it's not writing time that is specifically what i do to write and so having things like that that can get you in that frame of mind um is help i think is helpful and then also um if maybe if you consider journaling because sometimes if you can use that to get out some of the anxiety and negative feelings you're having about other stuff in general, you can get that out on the page and then turn to focus on your writing. So those would be the two tips I have. You have to turn off the internet <laughs> in my house. That's how it goes. <laughs> um, I, I, like, I like turn my phone into my husband, which is great because it's a pandemic, so he's here too. Um, before, before the pandemic, I'm, I'm also like, this is not a, a specific to this world, but I'm obviously very distracted by the internet. And, um, so there was a time when the internet was turned off at 1030 without my, like it went off on a timer and it came back on at 230 and I did not have the password to the router. So like, I couldn't, there was nothing I could do. <laughs> um, <laughs> right um or you know use up the phone data and get caught so <laughs> i mean the trick is turning it off right and that's so hard it's so hard i was talking to our friend adriana herrera about this the other day that there is this like especially for those of us who've been cooped up in in our houses you know i'm I'm in New York City, like we were, you know, the center of this for a long time. So it feels like I've been in my house for, I mean, it is true. I've been in my house for six months, almost seven months. And so my only line to like humans is this rectangle. And that makes everything very odd. Like you start, you start to convince yourself that everything is equally important. Like you have no frame of reference for what is like necessary versus un unnecessary and so um turning this off is so important and it is so hard so that's not good advice but if you can turn it off do and you can do it for 45 minutes you know I have an app on my phone called forest and you can just like it it blocks everything related to the internet you know for a prescribed length of time and you know, my whole work is I try to write 500 words whenever I open the document. I don't write every day, um, but 500 words is, you know, two pages. And usually if you get to 500 words, you can get to 1,000. You can get to 1,500. Yeah. But yeah. like, I don't open the document without writing 500 words. Like, this is the thing. This is the thing that I learned 
is especially early on, I would go to all of these workshops with writers to, you know, be like, write better, faster, write longer, you know, how to, how to write without distractions, like all of these things, because I was convinced that there was some magic thing that I just didn't know. And everyone else knew it. And as soon as I knew it, it would make this easier. And I hate to say this, it's just not easy. You, I mean, I love it. I love what I do. I love it so much. It's the only reason why I would continue to do it. Um, but it's not easy. It's hard work and you just have to, you just have to love it. And sometimes yeah. there is no, we can't give you a tip. Sometimes this is really is, you just have to sit your ass down and write <laughs> your work. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot, but you know, when I had a baby, you are anybody who know who has had a baby or knows people who have ba babies knows that like when people have a baby, everyone has advice. Like everyone, like the weird person on the street has advice for you. Um, and that's lovely. But the, um, you know, my husband's advice was my husband now has advice when someone has a baby and his advice is take every piece of advice and file it away in the middle of the night when that kid is screaming its head off and nothing works the weird person on the street device is going to be the thing that works for 15 minutes like everything works for 15 minutes and i it is true about babies and it is also true about writing like listen to lots of people talk about writing because like at some point someone is going to say something and it's going to work for that one day or that one scene or maybe that whole book Right. You know, That's my good. friend, Melissa Walker, who writes YA novels, she, she will not eat lunch until she has written 1500 words, <laughs> which I think is like a very unfortunate thing, but, <laughs> but like, she's like, that's her reward. Like she won't eat lunch. And so she gets hungry and is like, I'm going to just bang it out. Cause I want to eat my salad. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a whole there's a whole question about whether or not that's a healthy relationship with food or work, but that's fine. It works. <laughs> our process, our process. <laughs> I don't judge. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's astonishing <laughs> and amazing. Um, we also have a question uh, about, um, are there any, quote, rules of writing romance that you shouldn't break besides, of course, the happily ever after? or happily for now? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I think there are things that will get you uh, that readers don't like, right? Like uh, infidelity, for example. But I mean, like I've written a romance that where the hero was unfaithful to the heroine. Uh, so, you know, but there are some people who won't read that book of mine, which is fine. Like, that's a hard limit for them. I think readers are savvy and they know what they are willing to read and what they are not willing to read. Like, I think, um, I think there's like a no-no corner, meaning like, um, nobody who is like a sociopath, no one who is, who perpetuates, say, genocide, um, no one who enslaves other people, no Nazis. Well... well. <laughs> I feel like those books have been written um, just, yeah uh, that's maybe that's a please don't that's a please, please don't. don't yeah that's a please don't um it's like could we not could, but, yeah you know not every okay let me take it back not everybody <laughs> needs to have their story told um yeah. yeah um I think you can do save that like save the whole genocidal racist nazi all of that stuff put that aside i think you can do lots of things if you do it well i think the important thing um might be to know sort of what the general rules are before you start breaking them right so that you un know and understand sort of what it is about this particular rule because um when you break it or twist it you're you know maybe you're doing so for a, a certain reason. There's an intent behind it. And so if that's the case, most of the readers will go along with you on that. But you wanna know that that's what you're doing, not just do it because you didn't know. 
Well, yeah. I think going back to my infidelity romance, right? The, yes. First of all, that was my 10th or 12th book, right? So mm-hmm. like readers knew, like I, I was, I knew the rules, like right. readers knew. Yes. Um, yes. And I seeded that romance for two books prior. So readers had some time to cook the idea that that hero had done this terrible thing. Um, And their story was going, they knew going in that that story was gonna tell a story that that they would or would, there was sort of a content issue there. Like they knew what that story was gonna be. And so the tr- it goes back to trust, yeah. That's trust and doing it well. I mean, like you start, you know, um, Daring in the Duke, and I hope this is not a spoiler alert, with the idea that the hero uh, tried to, the, that she, they believe that he tried to kill her when she was younger. No, no, that could be a no, no. <laughs> in less talented hands, but also in someone who knew that that was something. I think there's a lot in that book that she knew um, was subversive, which she did anyway, which I love. <laughs> but we knew that that was a rule. And then because we trust her and we trust her skill um, and we know what genre we're in, we knew that she was going to deliver us at the other end, safe and sound. Um, and we would understand what happened. I knew. I knew from book one. But that's just me. <laughs> I understand the genre, but anyway, so yeah, you know, you can do, you can break rules. I think just knowing that, that you're doing the, that you're doing that is important. And then you just should be really good when you do it. Yeah. You gotta have the range. <laughs> you gotta have the range quote of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's one more question that I see. And if I missed a question, you know, drop it in the comments real quick. Um, but we're buttoning up against time just a little bit. But so, but we have a question for Sarah about possibly teasing a little bit of your upcoming series, Hell's Bells. Sure. Um, yeah, so my new series is called Hell's Bells. Um, and those of you who have read Daring and the Duke have already met some of the bells. Um, they are in the, in the series. The Duchess of Treviscan, who plays a pretty important role I think even though it's a small role in uh in Derek and the Duke is the leader of the Bells um so you don't get her book for a while (laughs) but uh because I need her I need her to do other stuff she can't just fall (laughs) in love um so uh the first book which is (laughs) we are going around and around on a title right now so I'm sorry I don't have a title for you the first book is the story of Cecily Talbot and her American bartender, um, which feels very contemporary, but is not at all. Um, from Day of the Duchess, you, a lot of you have been asking for Cecily. I kept telling you, you needed to wait. This is why you needed to wait. Um, when I craft a series, I craft it in completion. So Hell's Bells is four books, for example, um, or rather, so the book, the series that just finished, Fair Knuckle Bastards, is three books. And I knew the end of Daring and the Duke, that sort of big set piece ending, I've known for four years since I sold uh, Bare Knuckle Bastards to my publisher. So Hell's Bells has a similar arc. There's a whole ending that I already know, which is five, you know, four years from three and a half, four years from now, um, I think. I don't want to think about it. I'm really too hard about that. So, <laughs> um, so each story, so um, the heroines are all, are all um, archetypes, like like women archetypes in romance. So uh, it's the scandal, the spinster, the blue stocking, and the duchess. And they all, they're basically like, imagine if they're fixers. So they're like a girl gang slash the A-team. And, uh, and if you have a problem, they will make sure there is a plan that comes together to fix it. So um, that is what is happening with these women. And then um, there are all these men who are sort of clubbed over the head with um, how amazing and also terrifying they are. So they might as well fall in love. Yes. <laughs> into their world. Into their world. Yes. <laughs> Sounds exquisite. Um, um, but soon enough, there will be a title, and uh, and I will share it. 
Amazing. All right, we have two questions that I missed beforehand, so I'm so sorry, everyone, but we're getting them in now. Um, also for Sarah, we've had a couple of questions about whether 72 Shelton Street, Grace's Bordello, um, was based on real uh, female bordellos historically from your research or whether that was sort of, uh, uh, um, yeah, from your imagination, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, well, I mean, obviously, <laughs> 72, there are a lot of pieces of 72 Shelton that are not, that are my imagination, right? Like the parties, the, you know, like that, the kind of the circus, the circus, all the stuff that ends up in Grace's book, that's all me and not, there's no evidence that that stuff happened. Although there is a lot of ev evidence that parties like that happened in men's clubs, so why not? Um, there is a lot, there is a big giant hole in the research on um, sex work in, the, in history because in the early 1800s and preceding the early 1800s and this book, sex work was legal. Um, and so there's, you know, there's documentation about uh, clubs and sex clubs and um, bordellos from earlier. And then when Victoria became queen, sex work was one of the first things that parliament really came for, um, largely because women, Victoria's relationship with women was not great. Um, Victoria's relationship with all people who were marginalized was not great. So, um, oh, Victoria. <laughs> oh, Victoria. So, um, so that all that setting that aside there is evidence of course there 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 is evidence that there were women's clubs that women had pleasure clubs that women had gambling gaming halls um that women had gangs that women were i mean anything men could do women could do backwards in high heels right and so that was so anything that's in the book that really is codified as history is actual history there were sex uh there were male sex workers who serviced you know, high, who worked in high-end bordellos, um, and it was legal, and they serviced women and men. Um, so there was a really interesting period of time during the Regency, sort of the, right around kind of the 18, the 1790s, kind of through to about 1820, 1825, where sex was really, um, sex work was not as criticized as one would think during that time. Um, and uh, that is a problem with historical accuracy, the perception of historical accuracy in romance novels, which is m a much bigger conversation that I would love to come back and talk about sometime. <laughs> That'll be for the TED talk that we'll do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and one more question that I uh, missed earlier, so again, I'm, I apologize, was how do you write a first chapter or a prologue that really hooks the reader without bombarding them with, you know, too much backstory? You go. Oh my god. <laughs> again, talk about a, a, a TED talk that you could just do on your own. Um, so I think the important things um, for me when I'm writing my first chapter is uh, to know what POV character is going to, who, that's going to be the first chapter, um, what their goal is, um, and I mean external, the thing that they want the most in the entire world, and then some sort of issue of what their internal um, arc is, sort of what their wound is and the thing that's going to, that they're going to heal so that they can fall in love. I think this is why I do a lot of planning and plotting before I start writing. So when I write the first chapter, I think all of those things need to be in there because while my, her my hero or heroine, usually my heroine, doesn't have to be likable, you need to know what the story is about. You need to know what is important to her so that you buy in and you are ready to go on this journey. And so if I am not clear on that and the character doesn't make that clear in the first chapter, you, there's no chance for the reader to be hooked or interested in where we're all getting ready to go. And so it may feel sometimes that it's so overt to say, you know, if, for example, for Nick, you know, that she wanted to be an orthopedic 
surgeon with a sports medicine specialty and that she was getting ready to do this fellowship. Like it may feel really overt to say that, but you need to know that that is the most important thing to her in her life in the beginning. And then you need to know that she has no time for a relationship in that life and um, nothing's going to come before that so that you buy in as things begin to happen that push her further and further away from that goal. Mm -hmm. um, there is, and I was looking while Tracy was talking and I can't find it on my desk um, because I, I rearranged, uh, but there is a list, there is, if you Google like the rules of Disney storytelling, um, it'll show you like every Disney and Pixar movie operates on the exact same beat structure, right? So it's like this needs like you introduce the character, the character is like you introduce the character in their own life, like in the in normalcy, and then you move them kind of forward. Um, and so first of all, Google that because I use it as a really, it's a very useful tool. And I know that they're children's movies, but they really keep you in the story, yeah. which is the whole point of, our, I mean, if it takes you longer than six hours to read one of my books, I've done something wrong as a storyteller. Like, I want you not to be able to put it down. Like, that's the goal. Um, so for me, on top of everything that Tracy has said, like obviously by the time that I've revised and I've gotten to a point where like the book works, all of that stuff is packed into the first chapter. But for me, like almost always, um, my first chapter is really active. Um, and so sometimes that's literally like somebody running. And sometimes that's like the first chapter of Daring and the Duke, you know, if you leave aside the children sort of flashback, which I thought was important because it was, it set a scene. It was important to this book. Um, the first chapter, the first like real time chapter of Daring and the Duke is Grace in her club, right? So we see her in Dominion, literally, um, what, you know, as a queen, like Grace has survived. Like she is a survivor who is now royalty. And like, why would she take any of his garbage? And then the very end of that scene is her climbing the stairs to just, and the reader discovers that in there, that she has him in a bed upstairs, unconscious. He's and in like, a tower. he's in a tower. <laughs> he's in a tower. <laughs> so, um, so that, I mean, obviously like that's a cinematic, that's a, that's a very cinematic first scene and it's one of my most cinematic first scenes I think like they don't always come out that way um but what you want is to show your character your point of view character either in danger and not not necessarily physical danger but like danger of losing her job or danger of like you want to see her in either in peril or you want to see her in like power you want to see your character in a way that the reader can say like, oh, I understand this character and I'm invested in them and I want to move forward. So those scenes are often not very dialogue heavy. They're like, they're often like pretty active. Um, and then you can slow down. My rule is like that first scene has to move at like a real pace. And then readers are in it and you can slow down in the next chapter and start like doing exposition and explaining backstory. Awesome. Um, and I think we are at our last question, which I am going to turn it back to y'all and say, is there anything that we didn't ask or that you would like, that you wish we had or that you would like to talk about? Well, you're asking us. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> or it's like, is there a, is there a, question, it out. <laughs> is there a question that you always want people to ask you in events, but they never do? I don't know. That's a good question. What's well, Tracy? Tell everybody what you're doing next, because I've already talked about health cells. So you do that. Well, I, yeah. Okay. So that would be good. I can't talk about what I'm doing next. So <laughs> obviously, you know, there the Girl Troop series is four books because it's four friends and it's um, based on women who went to college together and became lifelong friends, and so they go on vacation together every year, and so the book starts with the first chapter on a vacation, you get to see them interact and then it will follow one of the friends, you know, into her life as she fall in love. And so there's four friends, 
there's four books. So obviously there's two more books left in the Girl Strip series. Um, in the midst of locking down uh, what I was going to be doing next, because I'm a planner. This is, I mean, I'm so easy. I'm a planner. So I wanted to know what I was going to be doing. Um, I actually ended up um, pitching a series that got picked up. So I can't talk about it yet, but I am working on multiple things. So, yes. Well, I know what it is, and I'm not going to tell everybody, <laughs> but it's amazing. And this is why, remember when I said, I, I said, make sure you, you make friends, make friends so that when they are writing amazing books, you know about them. Exactly. Mm. <laughs> mm. You know, so that when they talk about certain things, and you can just be like, you really? Interesting. Yes, please <laughs> tell me more. I know. Me I know more. what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also just wanted to say thank you to One More Page and to the Fairfax Public yes. Library for doing this and having us. I'm sorry that it wasn't in person. Yes, I am. I am too. But thank you for being here. Thank you. I love talking to Sarah. I could. We could talk for like another hour. Um, so, but I really appreciate you guys having us. And, and making this work. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was amazing. I was doing this the entire time. So. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> and, uh, like, I'm taking notes. Like. <laughs> yeah, this was wonderful. I wish this could have been in person. That was the original plan for our Racy Beats event. Um, but thank you so much for joining us virtually. Rebecca, thank you for, for facilitating the Q&A. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, I will be sending out a program survey. Please tell me what you thought. This was our first Racy Reads event and this will become an annual event in August. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm always so used to doing applause at the end. I'm like, no, we can't <laughs> clap over camera. Well, you can do the reaction clap. I yeah, keep forgetting the, about the that. ASL, you, the well, ASL there we go. Clap. There you go. There it is. That little clap up in the. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Yay. Yeah. Thank you all for Thank coming. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Sarah and Tracy. Bye. Bye.